Hello, welcome to Until Ministries. We're pleased that you're with us. Well, believe it or not, we've come to Christmas time. Uh, and as we prepare for the Christmas season, uh, we're going to celebrate the incarnation and the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to concentrate on Jesus because Jesus is the reason for the season. It's all about Jesus. What we're going to do is we're going to take the five letters of the name Jesus and we'll take one letter each week for the next few weeks leading up to Christmas and we will take that letter, in this case J, we start with the first letter J, and we'll study a part of his being or his character or his mission or his gift, something that starts with that letter. And so today, since J is the first letter in the name Jesus, we're going to talk about joy. And if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we mentioned joy both last two weeks. We did the fruit of the Spirit, um, covered joy a couple of weeks ago. And then last week, we talked about finding our chief joy in Jesus. And so today, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the joy in the advent of, of Jesus, that is his birth and his coming, the joy and the anticipation by Jesus, and then we're going to finish up with the joy in abiding in Jesus. So let's look, let's get started right away. We're going to look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, uh, one of the Christmas uh, narratives that we find perhaps the best known. I know you're familiar with it. This is the passage that starts out, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, In those days, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and lineage of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room for them uh, in the inn. And we'll go on with that story. But I want to start, uh, and as we look into this today, uh, and this is, a pre uh, is very, very appropriate for the times that we're living in. Um, as we said last week, 2000. Uh, 20 has been a rough, rough year for all of us, and it continues to be a rough year with COVID, with political chaos, with other things that have happened during the year. It's been a rough one. And it's interesting that this passage, chapter 2 of Luke, starts out with this phrase. It says, it says, in those days, in those days. Well, what were those days like uh, at this time? What does it mean by in those days? And listen carefully, because you are going to be so surprised at the parallels. In those days, those were joyless days. There was spiritual and moral and personal darkness. There was no joy. There was fear. There was loneliness. There was confusion, turmoil, and emptiness. Sound familiar? These were difficult days that Jesus was born into. And we're going to see joy in the advent of Jesus coming. Even though they were joyless days, there was joy in Jesus. And that's what I want you to see here today. In those days, spiritually, the priesthood was defiled. There was spiritual and moral depravity, and that's what we have in the United States of America today, is spiritual and moral depravity. There was great need for spiritual comfort and spiritual uh, power, and so they were looking for a Messiah. We already have the Messiah who has come, 
Jesus came over 2,000 years ago and he bled and he died for our salvation. And so we should be joyful. But what I want you to see here is that Jesus burst into this situation because those were days of darkness and he burst in with his light. Those were days of sadness and he burst in with his joy. They, they were days of fear and loneliness and he burst in with his powerful presence and comfort and so on it goes. There was turmoil and emptiness and he came with fulfilling love and light. And so today we are in a period where we can actually say in those days and know that these are tough days. And this is very appropriate that as we go into the Christmas season, we'll concentrate on what it means to have Jesus come into this situation. So the next thing I want you to notice, we'll go on. Not only was joy in the advent of Jesus, um, it was for the period in those days, but it was also for the people. Listen to verse 10. Uh, let me go back to verse 8. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, Christ the Lord. So you see that Jesus' advent, his birth, his coming into this situation, it was not only for the period, those difficult days, but it was for the people. It was for the people. It says in verse 10, great joy for all the people. There was good news of a great joy which will be for all people the Bible says. And so it doesn't say, I will bring you great joy. It says, rather, I will bring you good news of great joy because the great joy is Jesus. Remember that. The great joy is Jesus. The J stands for joy. Speaking of the Savior, the Messiah, Christ the Lord. And that's what the angel said. Now, the angel was speaking to shepherds and shepherds were considered low-class outcasts in that society. And um, they, they weren't even allowed to testify in court. They were kind of looked down upon. And yet that, those are the ones that the angel came to, the shepherds. And it says in verse 20 that they were glorifying and praising. They had great joy. Listen to verse 20. Verse 20 says, The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard. So great joy was brought to the shepherds after they heard about Jesus and after they came to see him at the angel's invitation. You'll recall too that John the Baptist and his mother Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth conceived in her old age uh, and um, John the Baptist was her son and when he was still in the womb, when Mary came to greet her relative uh, Mar uh, Elizabeth, that the baby, John the Baptist, kicked in the womb. And the Bible says, leaped for joy in his mother's womb. So he even brought joy to, uh, to John the Baptist while he was still in the womb when he heard the greeting from Mary. So the arrival of Jesus is connected with joy. That's what I want you to remember. It was connected in joy for the period in those days and for the people. And it was also personal. Listen to this now. In verse 11, it says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. To you. Make this personal. It was made personal to the shepherds. The Savior was born to to you, the angel said, and to you, and to you, and to you, and to all of us, to me, make this personal. He, was, he came for you. He came to bring joy for you. He came personally for you. Each one of us, all of us, he came for us. And so I'm going to ask that this Christmas, as never before, make it personal. Make this Christmas personal. Make this Christmas the one where you say, 
Yes, this is where the Son of God came into this world, which was an awful mess then and is an awful mess now. And Jesus came into this world in that period for the people, for all the people, and for you personally. Personally, he came. And that brings joy. So this would be a great year for you to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I know you're the eternal son of God. I know that you became flesh uh, when you came in Bethlehem as a babe. I know you lived a perfect life. I know you died on the cross for my sin because you were sin sinless yourself. You died for my sin and you rose from the dead. And now, Lord Jesus, I'd like you to come into my heart to forgive my sin to give me eternal life, to be my Lord and Savior, to take over my life. And when you do that, when you confess your sin and seek forgiveness and ask the Lord to take over your life, you will have eternal life and you will have joy. That's something that he promises. So we see joy in the advent of Jesus. Now I want us to see something a little more, uh, something that we're not going to really think that much about when we think about Christmas, but we should. And that's joy in the anticipation by Jesus. And now we're going to talk about why Jesus came. And we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And we're going to see the word joy here, but it's in an unusual context. It's not the joy that we normally think about at Christmas time. But Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Then listen to this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Did you hear that? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow. Jesus took joy in going to the cross. His eye was on the prize. His eye was on our salvation. His eye was on uh, communion with us and, and relationship with us. And that joy carried him through the whole terrible ordeal of the cross. Well, you say, Pastor Bill, why are you mentioning that right now? I thought we were talking about Christmas. I thought we were talking about Advent. Well, we, we are, but we have to remember that Jesus was, when Jesus came into this life, when he came into human life, he had great anticipation. He had anticipation of the cradle when he came at Bethlehem, when he was in the manger. There was anticipation of the cradle. Jesus didn't begin in Bethlehem, we know that. He's always been, and he is now, and he always will be. He's eternal. He's eternal God. Jesus has always been. He created the world. John 1, 1 through 12 tells us how Jesus, nothing was made that without him. He's always been there. But yet, he looked forward with joy and with anticipation to coming to this earth, to coming as an infant, to coming as God in the flesh, but... He took joy not only in coming for the cradle, but he, as we've just read in Hebrews, he took joy in coming for the cross. You cannot separate the cradle from the cross. Jesus came to die. You and I were born to live. Jesus was born to die. He came to die for our sin. And for the joy ahead of him, that is, Reunion with the Father and Spirit, our salvation, our fellowship, the oneness, sin being conquered, death being conquered. For that joy, he endured the horrible ordeal of the cross. So you see, Jesus took joy in anticipation of both the cradle, coming as man, coming in human flesh, and of the cross, because 
You can't separate the two. You cannot separate the advent from the atonement. You cannot separate the manger from Mount Calvary. It's all together because that was Jesus' purpose. He was born to die for us and he took joy in that even though he had to lay down his life. He voluntarily laid down his life in that horrible sacrifice on the cross. It had to be. And yet Jesus approached it with joy because he could see what was on the other side. It was a, his mission all along. It was his mission to die on the cross. It was his mission to redeem us. And he took joy in that. So there's joy in Jesus' advent. There's joy in his anticipation, both of the cradle of the cross. And also, not just the cradle and the cross, but guess what? Jesus took joy in the crown. J is for joy. And Jesus took joy in his advent, in his anticipation of the cross, and of the crown. How does that fit in? How is it that Jesus had joy in the cradle, the cross, and now the crown? Well, the crown means that Jesus, after he died on the cross, he wasn't just a dead martyr. He conquered the cross. He conquered the grave. He conquered death. And he rose again mightily in the resurrection. He arose and he lives. And after he was on the earth for a period of 40 days, he ascended back to heaven from whence he had come after he had died for our sin, after he had risen from the dead, he ascended back into heaven. And guess what? The Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God on the throne. And now he was crowned, if you will, not with thorns like he was during his passion, like he was during the whole process of the crucifixion. He was crowned with thorns. But now he seats at the right hand of God the Father on high and he is crowned with victory. He is crowned with glory. He is crowned with majesty, not with thorns any longer. So you see, Jesus had joy of the crown as well. He was crowned with joy. What was the joy that was so great that he could endure the cross? It was our redemption. It was our salvation. It was anticipation of his bride, the anticipation of his bride. You know, the Bible says that we who are a body of Christ, anyone, any place in the world who has just done what I just described a few moments ago, who has received Jesus as their savior, who has asked for forgiveness of sin, who has turned their life over to the Lord and asked him to be their, the, their chief of their life, um, those people all make up the body of Christ. Uh, and that body is worldwide. And the Bible refers to that worldwide body of believers as the bride of Christ. And so the Lord Jesus was looking ahead with joy because he was going to have a bride. He was going to have a, a body of redeemed people who will love him and serve him. And that's the joy that he took. And so when he, uh, after he uh, gained our salvation and he rose from the dead and he went back to heaven, then he wore that crown of joy that he had looked forward to because we were redeemed and we were his bride. So notice in this same passage that I read in Hebrews 12 uh, verses 1 and 2, it's talking about us running for the crown. So we see that Jesus um, lived and died and rose again for the crown. And now we're encouraged to lay aside our encumbrances and entanglements and run the race of life with endurance based on the joy ahead. You see what Jesus is showing us here? He's showing us by example that we need to run the race of life in joy because we're looking ahead to what lies beyond. 
So no matter what happens in this life, we have the ultimate victory. We have the ultimate joy. We're going to be with the Lord. So he says, run the race, run the race of life and lay aside weights and encumbrances. Lay aside your baggage. Lay aside the things that distract you. Lay aside the things that hold you back. Lay aside your sin and entanglements. Put that all aside and run the race with endurance based on the joy of the crown ahead. Isn't that wonderful? That's what he's asking us to do. He's saying to us, he's saying we are his children now that we've received him as Savior. And he's saying, I want you to run the race of life for me. And I want you to run the race with endurance based on the joy ahead of you, which is being with me forever and ever. And the things that hold you back spiritually, the things that weigh you down spiritually, the things that tangle you up spiritually, whether it's sin or just things that are more important to you than, Lord, than God is, he says, put those aside. Get rid of those and run the race in endurance based on the joy ahead. That's exactly what he's saying. And so you and I, uh, we can imagine that in, then in, in, a, in a race, uh, somebody's competing in the Olympics and there's, there's a race. You know, we know that the person who is running, who has trained so hard, they can't be looking up in the stands or looking up at the TV cameras or looking over their shoulders to see where their opponent is. They can't be doing that. They have to be, have their eyes on the prize. They have to be running the race with endurance. And guess what? None of them have backpacks on. Why is that? Well, you can't have extra weight. You can't have extra baggage. You can't have things that are going to weigh you down or slow you down. You can't have that or hold you back. And you can't have entanglements. You can't have, they don't run on a track that's, that's full of all kinds of, uh, let's say, vines and debris and, and sticks and all those kinds of things. You can't run the race when there's something that's entangling you. That could be your sin. It could be something you're involved in that you shouldn't be in or even something that's basically good, but it's become more important to you than God and that you got to put that aside and you got to run that race. So run the race with endurance, with your entanglements and encumbrances laid aside. Keep your eyes on the prize. The prize is being with Christ. The prize is the joy ahead, being with the Lord forever and forever. So if you've never received Christ as your Savior, this Christmas, make sure that you make it personal. So we've looked at the joy in the Advent, the joy in the anticipation of the cross, and now we want to look at our joy in abiding in Jesus. And for this, we're going to look at John, the Gospel of John, and we're going to look at chapter 15. This is a beautiful passage. Many of you are familiar with it. John chapter 15, um, and we're going to be looking at verse 11. John 15, 11. So let's turn to that. John 15, 11 says this. Jesus is speaking. He's, you'll remember this. He has said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. There's that joy again that we're talking about. Jesus says, he talks in John 15, as I said, where that's the passage where Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you stay abiding in me, if you stay connected in me, if you are constantly with me, connected with me, living for me, drawing your strength from me like the, the branches do from the vine, he says, then you will have what? You have joy. <laughs> you will have joy. If you abide in him, if you are connected to him, if you are like the, the branches in the vine, then his joy is going to be in you and your joy is going to be complete. 
Isn't that great? See how it all ties together? So now we can see that there's joy abiding in Jesus. Jesus had joy in his advent, in his coming. He had joy in anticipation of dying on the cross. But you and I can have a joy by abiding in Jesus. That's where our joy comes from. This is for us. And our joy will be complete. And so even if we go back to our initial point in those days, even though we are in difficult days right now, in those days of turmoil and trouble and trials and tribulation and disease and confusion and chaos, all those things, we can still have joy if we abide in Jesus. We must be tied to Jesus like the branches are to the vine. It has to be a vital and a constant union. It means walking step by step with Jesus, like in a yoke where, where the animals that are in a yoke are in step. We're in Christ's yoke. He says, come unto me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says, my yoke is light. And if we're practicing his presence and we're vitally connected to him 24-7, 365 and a quarter, uh, we're in harmony with him. Our will coincides with his will. He's the very center of our life. Then we'll have joy despite the circumstances. Despite what's going on around us, we can have joy because Jesus is right with us. You see, it's all about him. It's not about us. And so the method to abide in Jesus is to love the Lord, to obey the Lord, to be vitally connected to the Lord, and then we will have joy. And then he goes on to say that when we do this, there's a measurement that tells us also, he says, you will bear much fruit you will bear much fruit. So we see a metaphor, the vine and the branches. We see the meaning that it's a vital and constant union. We see the method, it's accomplished through obedience and loving the Lord. And guess what? He gives us a way to measure whether we're abiding or not. Not only will we have joy, but he says, you will bear much fruit and your joy will be made full. So you see, we can look at our lives and tell how closely we're abiding with the Lord by how joyful we are and by how much fruit we're bearing. If our joy is full and we're bearing much fruit, that's because we're abiding. So I hope you've enjoyed this first Advent message. We'll have uh, four more, the other four letters of the name Jesus. And we'll remember in this Christmas season that Christmas is all about Jesus. All about Jesus. And have that joy as we think of his advent, his anticipation of the cross, and our abiding in him. God bless you. Thanks for listening.